try this again. Welcome to everyone. I'd love to see a full house for our board meeting, public hearing. So it's good to have you here. Uh, again, good morning. The first thing that we will do this morning is have a public, public hearing, and I will read the opening statement. This public hearing is held by the Louisville Metro Air Pollution Control Board all order and is being held pursuant to KRS Chapter 77 and district regulations. Notice that this hearing has been published pursuant to state law. Oral statements must be presented today. Statements should be concise. If you have a written version of your statement, please submit it to Ms. Hamilton after your presentation. All statements will become a part of the hearing record. There is one agreed board order, a proposed revised one hour SO2 attainment plan for the Louisville, Jefferson County, Kentucky non-attainment area, and a request for modification of STAR goals to be reviewed today. Today, the board will be acting on the agreed board order with Cosmos Cement Company. For the other two matters, the board provides the forum for the public hearings in accordance with district regulations, but does not vote on them. The district will submit this proposed state implementation plan, which of course is abbreviated SIP or SIP, uh, submittal to the U.S. EPA for approval in accordance with the Clean Air Act, and the district determines whether to approve a STAR program modification request after a public hearing is held in accordance with the APCD Regulation 5.21. This is because the board also serves as an appeal body for certain decisions made by the district. So first, would the staff please submit the agreed board order with Cosmos Cement Company? Mr. Otto. Good morning. My name is Paul Ott, and I'm the Industrial Permitting Manager for the district. The district brings before the board an agreed board order with Cosmos Cement Company. On August 5th, 2013, the United States Environmental Protection Agency designated a roughly 1.6 square mile portion of southwestern Louisville Metro in and around the Louisville Gas and Electric Company, Mill Creek Electric Generating Station, is not attainment for the 2010 one hour primary SO2 National Ambient Air Quality Standards of 75 parts per billion. Mill Creek is the sole stationary source of SO2 emissions within the non attainment area. LGE recently completed substantial improvements to the air pollution control unit <coughs> at Mill Creek. The Kentucky Division for Air Quality and the Louisville Metro Air Pollution Control District conducted regulatory modeling of Mill Creek in accordance with federal guidance that, with the improvements, does not predict emissions in excess of the one hour SO2 max. All other sources impacting the non attainment area were modeled and accounted for in background ambient monitoring data. A one hour SO2 plan for the Louisville, Jefferson County, Kentucky non attainment area, which further discusses this modeling and demonstrates that the area will timely attain the one hour SO2 max, is the subject of another public hearing later this morning. As a result of earlier modeling of the Cosmos Cement Company, of the Division for Air Quality and the District. The District has determined that it is necessary to conduct ambient air quality monitoring to better characterize the ambient concentrations of SO2 in the vicinity of the company's facility and determine whether those SO2 emissions violate the SO2 max outside of the non-attainment area as required by Regulation 3.01. The agreed order provides for the development of a source-specific ambient air monitoring site for SO2 in the area of predicted maximum impact south of the Cosmos Cement Company in the previously designated non-attainment area. This air monitoring station will become part of the district's air monitoring network once approved by US EPA. 
If at the conclusion of the proposed three-year monitoring period, the three-year average of the annual 99th percentile of the daily maximum one-hour average concentrations exceed the one-hour SO2 max, the company is required to submit a written plan of necessary remedial measures for approval by the district within six months and full implementation of those measures within 30 months of submitting its written plan. The district asked the board to take note that the version presented to the board today includes some non-substantive issues or typos not shown on the version posted on the district's website. I will recommend the board adopt this order as proposed. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Thank you, Mr. Rod. Would a representative of Cosmos Cement Company like to make a statement? Uh, we can't have a statement. Uh, so, so your statement is you have no statement? <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Thank you. Does anyone from the public wish to make a statement? Are there any questions by board members about this agreed board order with Cosmos in that time? Hearing none, then we will move on to the next item of our public hearing session. And would the staff please present the proposed revised one hour SO2 attainment plan? for the Louisville, Jefferson County, Kentucky non-attainment area. Mr. Perry. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Uh, the district is accepting comment today on a revised one-hour SO2 attainment plan, plan for the Louisville, Jefferson County, Kentucky non-attainment area. In August 2010, the US EPA promulgated the revised one-hour national ambient air quality standard, or NAS, for sulfur dioxide of 75 parts per billion average over three years. Uh, as Mr. Rogers explained, in August of 2013, the EPA designated small area in the far southwestern corner of Jefferson County is not attainment for this new standard. The area is primarily the property of the Louisville Gas and Electric Mill Creek Generating Station and a portion of the neighborhood immediately to its north. In order to meet new emission standards for power plants promulgated by EPA around the same time, the Mill Creek facility added significant new controls including new flue gas and sulfurization units which have substantially decreased their emissions of SO2. The district has placed new limits related to these controls in the Title V permit Facility. The attainment plan primarily relies on these new controls to achieve attainment. As a result of these emission reductions, ambient concentrations of SO2 in the non-attainment area have decreased precipitously. Monitoring for 2016 showed the design value for the past three years of 76 parts per billion and a one-year concentration of 17 parts per billion. Monitoring thus far in 2017 shows a 99 percentile of 28 parts per billion. The district anticipates, and this attainment demonstration shows, that the partial non-attainment area is expected to be in attainment before the required attainment date of October 2018. The attainment plan also contains a comprehensive base year projected emission inventory, a model demonstration of attainment through the non throughout the non-attainment area, conformity requirements, provisions for new source review in the non-attainment area, and contingency measures in the event attainment is not reached in a timely manner. Thank you. Does anyone for the public wish to make a, a statement about this issue? <coughs> Are there any questions by board members? I have a question. Just curious, uh, after the installation of the new Please submit a request for modification 
of star goals by American synthetic rubber companies. Mr. Roger. Thank you, Dr. Bob. The district received a request for modification from American Synthetic Rubber Company, or ASRC, to modify certain environmental acceptability goals under the Strategic Toxic Air Reduction, or STAR, program. It is this proposal that is the subject of today's hearing. The district is not proposing to put in the STAR program regulations. The STAR program was adopted in 2005 in response to concerns about air toxics in West Louisville. Some of those in the room today were involved in the public process of developing and passing the STAR regulations. The regulations require large companies to characterize and quantify their toxic air contaminant emissions and compare them to the environmental acceptability goals of the STAR program. For non-industrial property, places where people live and play, the goal is one in a million from a single chemical from a single process and seven and a half million for all chemicals from all sources at that facility. For industrial property, the goals are adjusted by a factor of 10. The regulations also provide for modifications of these goals if the company uses the best available technology for toxics, or TVAP, to achieve the maximum reductions in and risk from toxic emissions for those goals that it is seeking to modify. ASRC is seeking to modify the environmental acceptability goals on non-industrial property for emissions of 1,3-butadiene from two separate processes, its flare and fugitive emissions. ASRC's modification request does not modify the cumulative plant-wide environmental acceptability of 7.5 million for non-industrial property. ASRC has also applied to modify the environmental acceptability goals on industrial property for fugitive emissions of 1,3-butadiene, including the cumulative plant-wide environmental acceptability goal of 75 in a million. It may amend its original request for modification in the future. ASRC has proposed its flare thermal oxidizer as TVET for emissions that had gone to its flare, which now serves as a backup control device. Proposed TVAC for fugitive emissions include enhanced leak detection and repair replacement of all rupture discs in 1,3-butadiene service, reduced thresholds for the first attempt at repairs, and reduced leak repair timeframes. If the district approves the modification, the regulations require that a company reevaluate TVAC every five years when it renews its operating time. The regulations also provide that the district may require a company to implement a revised TVAC at any time if it would achieve greater compliance with the original environmental acceptability goals. Additional details about ASRC's request for modification and proposed enforceable permit conditions are available on the district's website. A second public comment period has been opened, and a second public hearing on the request for modification will be held May 17, 2017, at 6 p.m. in this room. If ASRC revises its request for modification, the district will extend the public comment period and notify the public via legal notice in the Courier Journal, Gov Delivery, and by posting on the proposed actions portion of our website. Any documents related to a revised submittal will also be posted there. Public comments, whether submitted in writing or made as part of a public hearing, will become part of the record. A written response to the comment document will be made available at the time the district makes a final determination on ASRC's request for modification. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Thank you, Mr. Rod. Would a representative of American Synthetic Company <coughs> company like to make a statement? Yes. We would like to do some visuals, please. <coughs>
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Guillaume Farton. I have the uh, immense pleasure of being the plant manager at the American Synthetic Project. I have worked at ASRC for now 18 years. I've held a variety of positions in the plant, and that has led me to be the plant manager for the past three years. I would like to thank the board for giving us the opportunity to make a mistake. So the purpose of our presentation today is to give you background information on American synthetic rubber emissions. Um, there's been a lot of interest for American synthetic rubber emissions, and we thought we would give you some background information in terms of our record and what we're doing to improve and reduce our emissions. So first off, I would like to show you our record so that we do not have any misperception of what ASRC's record is. So what you see on this graph, and I'll describe it, is at the bottom the emission from 2003 to 2016. And what you see is the height of the bar graph is basically the emissions of one tribute There are two types of emission. There's stack emissions 
and fugitive emissions. And we'll describe what they are later. So what you see from that graph is that in 2003, we were in the 110,000 pounds of emission from American synthetic rubber. And what you see is in the period of 2003, 4, and 5, we significantly lowered our emission of about 90%. And since 2006, our emissions have been consistently 90% less than what they were in 2003. ASRC is not seeking to increase its emission, open power. We're trying to do the opposite. So I wanted to make that record very public and very known that we have been since 2006 90% lower emission than 2003. So let's talk a little bit more about what stack emission and fugitive emissions are because they are critical to understand when it comes to the star program. So first off, a stack emission is kind of what it means, is comes out of a stack. So at ASRC, we have two emissions from stacks. We have the flare stack, which is here, and the flare thermal oxidizer. The flare stack collects all the plant emissions into those black pipes here, and it goes up that stack, and at the top of that stack, there's a flame that destroys those emissions. In 2005, ASRC voluntarily installed the flow thermal oxidizers to reduce its emission. That's what it looks like. So it's a much more efficient system to uh, destroy emissions, and there is almost nothing that comes out of that stack. Currently, the flare stack that you see here is still at ASRC and it acts as a backup to the flow thermal oxidizer. So should that flow thermal oxidizer go down for maintenance, we have a backup solution. So that's what we mean when we talk about stack emission. In 2005, the flow thermal oxidizer was recognized as best available technology, as Mr. Odd alluded to when it comes to the stock program. So that's the first category, stack emission. The second category of emission is called fugitive emission. So let's talk about what fugitive emission means. Well, fugitive emissions are a tiny little amount of emission that come out of piping systems. You can't see them. They're invisible. They're so small. And what we do is we have a third-party contractor that monitors those connectors for fugitive emission. You see a technician right there. He's holding a detector and he's looking for emissions. What you see here is a flange. On a, on a pipe, and this is a valve. So those have the ability to emit a very small amount of leakage. So what we do is we monitor those connectors very frequently in the, in the factory. As a matter of fact, ASRC spends $350,000 every year just to do the monitoring. It doesn't even include the cost of the repair. So just to monitor, we spend $350,000. So that's what a fugitive emission is. So the technician puts his little wand, and then the question is, well, what if he finds something? Well, if he finds that the uh, amount of measure exceeds a certain threshold, then we immediately initiate a repair process. And that repair process consists of several steps. The first thing we do is we try to time the connection just to make sure that that doesn't stop to begin with. If that's not successful, then either two things. Either we shut down the process and do the repair, or we put an engineered clamp on that connector to stop the leak. And that's what you see here. We physically install an engineered system that stops the leak. Okay, so again, you have stack emissions, flow thermal oxidizer, and then a few different emissions. Now, let's go back to the STAR program when it was enacted in 2000. So when the STAR program was enacted, as Mr. Odd referred to, there are several components for the STAR program. There are the all chemical, what he refers to all tax from all sources, and then there's the single chemical from either fugitive or stack. In 2006, when ASRC first 
comply with STAR, we already had to make a request for modification. Because what we found is that we could meet the goal for all tax, all chemicals, for both industrial property and non-industrial property. But we were having difficulty with the single tag, the single chemical, and butadiene in particular. So back in 2006, or 2007, we worked with the district to establish best available technology. The framework of the STAR program is clear. If the company cannot meet the goal, it has, the company has to demonstrate best available technology. So back in 2007, that's what we did. We obtained best available technology for staff through the use of the thermal oxidizer. And we implemented a series of improvements on how to deal with fugitive emissions back then. That was the first time. The Air Board, the Air Pollution Control District, approved that modification request back in 2008. Now, in 2013 and 14, it's very hard to see, but ASRC exceeded the goals that were set up in that agreement of 2008. Again, it's very difficult to see because we're so much lower than we used to be, but we still exceeded those goals. So, obviously, we had to then go back to the Air Board and we entered an agreed board order to implement another series of measures to demonstrate best available technology. And that's what we're here today. So in 2015, if you remember, we took the agreed board order. We agreed to do a series of things. Everybody okay? All right. And in, uh, so we, we are here today to for the second request modification. Now something that is very important is that we formulated our second request for modification based on the 2013 and the 2014 result. And now in 2016 we've obtained great results and you'll see that we want to further reduce the amount we're requesting in the modification. So what are they? Let's talk about those. Those are the numbers that Mr. Odd introduced in the beginning. So there is the all chemical from all processes, Industrial, meaning within the fence line of uh, SRC, and non-industrial, which is means in the neighborhood adjacent to SRC. And those are the goals that you see, the environmental acceptability goals. So when we did exceed the, uh, uh, the goals in 2013, 2014, we requested uh, a proposed modification goal, and what you see are the numbers that we requested. After we implemented the uh, elements of the board order, we obtained very good results in 2016. And that allows us today to further amend our proposed request for modification and reduce the request for modification. We, we made a press release last week that actually announced that we are no longer requesting a modification for the all type all processes on industrial sources. So this is the status of where ASRC is. So we are in the process of formulating a revised request for modification that includes the very good results that we obtained in 2016. So <coughs> as you saw, sorry, as you saw here, because we implemented the thermal oxidizer, the majority of our emissions now are fugitive. They're no longer stack, they're fugitive. So the question that you may ask is what are what is ASRC doing? To reduce its fugitive emission. And what I would like to show you is the best available technology that we've come up with. And more important, I want to show you the results that we've obtained uh, with this best available technology. So Mr. Odd already alluded to them in his introduction. The first one is we replaced all the rupture discs uh, in the butadiene service. Well, our analysis showed that those were more prone to have fugitive emissions. So we invested and we replaced all of them. That's done. We did that in 2015. We also changed the definition of what's called a leak. You remember the technician that goes with his wand and, and looks for an emission? Before, he was looking for 500 parts per million. So anything that would be above 500 parts per million would be considered a leak. We've changed that threshold to 250 parts per million. So we went 50% lower. What that means is that now, at a lower level, we'll be initiating a repair. That's the place we're doing that. We've also increased 
the amount of monitoring that we do. And for your benefit, I have summarized what we're doing in terms of increased monitoring. And that's the table that you see here. So those are the type of connectors that we monitor at ASOS. And I'm going to use one example. I'm going to use the example of the valve. That was the that valve that was on that picture from the technician. That's a valve right there. We have a significant number of those valves. So before the implementation of the STAR program, we would send the technician to check every valve once a year. In 2007, when the board agreed to the, board, to the uh, modification request, we went semi-annual, so twice a year, we check for those valves. Since the revised agreed board order, we're now doing that quarterly, four times a year. I would like to point out that some of the connectors before the implementation of the STAR program were only monitored every four years. In 20, 2007, we went semi annually Now we do it four times a year. I would like to also point out that before the STAR program, there were things that were exempt that were not even checked at all, that were checked semi annually in 2007, and now we check quarterly. So when we say we're doing best available technology to reduce future emission, that's what that means. Now let me show you the result because you could say, okay, it's interesting, but what about the results? So that's on the chart here. What you see here are the results of ASRC's fugitive emissions from 2013 and 14, where we had the issue that came from the war, to 2016. And this is the pound of emission for that year. So what you see is in 2013 and 2014, we were in the 7,000 pound range. In 2016, we obtained a very good result below 4,000. That represents a 47% reduction in the butadine fugitive emission. So that, this is how STAR works. We go in front of the board, we agree to best available technology, we implement those best available technology, and then we get results. So I would like to leave you with uh, some thoughts. First off, I want to tell you that we really strive for solid cooperation and transparency with the public. ASRC has been a proud member of the Robertown Community Advisory Council for many, many, many years. And ASRC attends every monthly meeting. I encourage you, if you're interested, to join the Robertown Community Advisory Council. Because every month, we get an opportunity to exchange between the public and between the companies on what's going on in the companies. Strongly encourage you to join if you're interested. We would like the district to we would like to request the district to recognize that ASOS is diligent in uh, implementing best available technology and that we would like the modification to be granted. Mind you, after we amend that request for modification based on the good result of 2016. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do any of the speakers from the public have any, uh, any slides to show so that the presentation record? If not, we'll reassemble them from the room.
told, um, I wasn't sure what the time limit was for speaking. I'm hoping you guys allow me to speak my entire, <coughs> make my entire statement. Um, ASRC got maybe around 13 minutes, and I think the community, uh, the community hardly ever gets to attend these meetings, so I hope you guys listen. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make a statement very short uh, on behalf of REACT. Then I'm gonna make a statement that is a joint statement between REACT and the Kentucky Resources Council. And then I'm gonna end that with another very short statement that is REACT's own. So, in 2003, ASRC was one of the companies denying its emissions were high. So I'm glad to see that today they are now owning that in 2013 they had very high emissions of one three to nine. Hopefully they continue to improve as they should. While we are elated that ASRC has decreased their emissions significantly, they are still not meeting the goal set. You do not reward success by allowing potential increased risks to health. This is a single chemical that we're talking about, but they emit many and so do the companies near them. Because of the threat of STAR, ASRC reluctantly did the right thing. So let's uphold the goals, goals and standards set to ensure that ASRC continues to work toward reductions. So that was my little snippet on behalf of REACT. Now I'm gonna read you a joint statement between REACT and the Kentucky Resources Council. Uh, I'm Ebony Neal Cochran, and I'm here providing a joint statement from REACT and the Kentucky Resources Council, Incorporated, in opposition to the request for modification by American Synthetic Rubber Corporation of certain standards of the STAR program. The council was actively involved in the development of the STAR program. REACT was instrumental in garnering community support for the program. STAR is a program that has been recognized nationally as a model of addressing and reducing the risks to workers and the public associated with the emissions of toxic chemicals into the ambient air from industrial sources. It has been 12 years since the APCD adopted the STAR program, requiring manufacturers such as ASRC to demonstrate the environmental acceptability of their air emissions and to submit a compliance plan to achieve target risks limits for individual and all air toxic emissions or to seek a modification of such goals after installing the best available technology for toxics, toxics or TPAT. TPAT is defined as an emission standard reflecting the maximum reduction in emissions of and risks from toxics. It may include work practices, air pollution control equipment, equipment maintenance measures, and alternative processes and process designs. It has been almost a decade since ASRC submitted and received approval of modified standards for emissions of 1,3-butadiene from the flare and from fugitive sources. It should be noted that while the STAR program has set risk-based goals translating into numerical emission standards based on calculated risks of exposure, there is no level at which exposure to workers or the public from a carcinogen such as 1,3-butadiene is therapeutic or beneficial and no linear threshold below which such exposure to carcinogens is without health risk. The request for modification that the staff proposes to approve comes in the wake of 2015 enforcement action taken after the district determined that emissions of 1,3-butadiene exceeded the already relaxed and modified EA goals for emissions from fugitive sources approved in 2008. The final resolution of that enforcement action has not yet been presented to the public or the board. And we are entitled to know why it is that the proposed technology and other actions approved in 2008 failed to produce reductions in emissions levels below the relaxed individual EA goals that approved at that time. The STAR program was not intended as a validation of the use of the public's care for toxic waste disposal from industrial facilities. It was intended to drive down emissions in a continuous manner as technology and process modifications progressed with the goal of elimination rather than merely management of such risks. It certainly was not intended to reward non-compliance with further relaxation of EA goals or by allowing increased emissions and elevated risks to workers or the public. Yet, ASRC proposes and the staff recommends approved increased emissions of 1,3-butadiene from fugitive sources and a modification of EA goals for both the general um, and workers. REACT and the council 
believe that any further modifications or extension of modified EA goals should be rejected. Reacting <coughs> Council also requests the following actions be taken. Res one, resolution of the pending enforcement action, including as part of an agreed board order, an independent assessment commissioned by staff and paid for by ASRC as to whether the existing TVAC for both all emission resources remains the best technology or whether there are additional enhancements in process and emissions control equipment that could reduce or eliminate the need for continued or expanded modifications. Two, public review of that assessment and of a pro proposed final order in the pending enforcement action. And three, production by SRC of an assessment of the health effects of exposure to one three denying to workers and the public for any emissions proposed in excess of individual EA goals. It should be re remembered that a modification can be improved if, if it meets two standards in the STAR regulations. First, that TVAC is or will be met, and second, that the resulting emission standard would provide an ample margin of safety to the exposed population. Meeting TVAC alone does not allow imposition of unsafe levels of emissions to the public or workers, and that assessment must be specific to the chemical or chemicals involved and be based on the best available toxicological information. Now that's the end of our combined statement. I have a small word uh, from REACT. All right, so I would like to add that leading up to the adoption of the STAR program, members of this community put in tireless, unpaid hours of work towards studying the STAR program, providing data-driven comment and increasing support for it. There was a community consensus that this is what the community wanted and what was in the best interest of the community's health. At the time, it was reported that um, it was the largest response to a comment period that the APCD had ever received, either in writing or uh, by the number of people who showed up at the hearing, uh, which, is, which is evidence that people in the community wanted these restrictions to pollution. We have a right to clean air. Please do not undermine our efforts, um, our health or our safety, to appease a company that must bear the cost of business. Don't, uh, okay, I can't read my hand right. <laughs> Don't, uh, please don't continue to put this burden of toxic chemicals on the backs of the citizens who live in this in this uh, city and on the workers. And I will say that, you know, sometimes this data is misleading. So when people in the community hear, oh, there's only going to be two cancers within one million people and blah, 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 it's a lot more serious than that. Because number one, one three beta dying is not only a carcinogen, but it's associated with respiratory illness, cardiovascular illness, neurological illness, all of these things. Um, so it's a lot more, uh, a lot more ailments are associated with it. And we want you guys to do the responsible thing and, and um, err on the side of caution. Um, we, the people in the public, don't have the dollars that ASRC has. Um, I went to probably almost all of the 120 stakeholder meetings that were held back leading up to the 200, 2005 adoption of the STAR program. And multiple people in the community had to take off work, unpaid, show up, miss family dinners because it was that important for us to be healthy and safe. ASRC, every time they showed up to the stakeholders meeting, their consultants, their lawyers, their employees were getting paid. Okay? So we need you guys to do the responsible thing. This should be, any, any, any decisions you make should come through the lens of community health and community safety, not through the lens of how easy can we make it for these companies. Okay? The reason that ASRC did such a great job initially in reducing their 13 3 dying emissions was because of the threat of STAR. It wasn't even, even before STAR was implemented, they were threatened by STAR, so they started doing the work. So let's keep that threat alive by holding fast to the standards that were set so that ASRC can continue to uh, reduce their emissions as they have tremendously reduced reduce them so that we'll be safe in our homes. So that when we go home to our kids, you know, we can have a happy family game of tennis in the park without smelling emissions. And I'm not talking about specifically one three three nine, but any emissions that you come out with. I shouldn't have to go to Chickasaw Park and say, oh, son, we can't play tennis today because
because I'm selling overs from companies like yours. Or there's some kind of alert app. I should be able to walk down the beautiful parkway that we live near and know that my son is not going to go home with some sort of respiratory illness. So you, you guys need to do your best. And, oh, sorry. You guys need, sorry, Mom. You guys need to do your best to continue to reduce. And I do applaud you for that initial reduction, but you need to continue. There's no excuses. And for your work.
With that all being said, I want to make it very clear, I've said it publicly, and will continue to say it publicly, that I am unapologetically and unequivocally opposed to the modifications for this plan. I can't speak all the, the, the scientific language that are experts for that, but what I do have to give up is speaking the language of the people. It is poor policy to grant this modification. It is also a slap in the face to the hundreds of individuals who spent countless hours working on the STAR program. Most importantly, it is a complete slap in the face of the residents who live in these neighborhoods. It is a slap in the face to say, well, hey, we're reducing it, so hey, just deal with what we give you. Um, right before I came here, I was coming from 18th and Broadway where there was a major announcement for West Florida. With all that being, being said, every time you take one step forward, it seems like you are pushed five steps back in West Florida, and that we are forced to bear the brunt for the entire city of New Orleans. We are forced to bear the brunt for these plans. I am very appreciative and do, do applaud them for their reduction. However, there is still more work to be done. And so instead of us saying, hey, go home, it doesn't matter because the reductions are there, hey, those people on West Global, if we reduce it, then who cares if they get a, a little bit of cancer? We should continue to say to these corporations, continue to work hard, continue to march forward. These regulations were put in place for a reason. I don't ever want to feel like the regulations were put in place just to appease vocal people. <laughs> the regulations, in my estimation and in my belief, were put in place for companies to be to have to follow. Let's force these corporations to have to follow the rules that are put in place, and let's not change the rules mid-show. <coughs> my people cannot take any more. I don't know how much and how vocal I can be when I say this. People are suffering and people feel like nobody cares. The residents' lives are more important than a modification for a company. Please respect the lives of the people in district. When I will be here every single time you all convene to have this discussion because I want you all to know how serious this is to me. I live in these same neighborhoods, the same neighborhood with my children. My children's lives and my lives are as important as the lives of anybody else around the entire city of Louisville. Please give the constituents of District 1 the same respect that you will want to have for your own family and your own communities. And I am asking and imploring you all to reject this modification. Thank you very much. Dogs don't usually die of cancer. 
And I thought it was just, you know, my animal. But then my daughter, who lived a few blocks away, who had an American Staffordshire Terrier, started getting lumps on its head. And it developed cancer. So, and in the last few weeks, I have to go back in and have another surgery. And I still live in that area. So, we have to do something because our lives do matter. We need to be safe. And I have a question for the gentleman that did the presentation. Is your office located in that area or is your office somewhere else? It's in the plant. In the plant? Do you wear any protective clothing, no. masks? Do your employees? No. Does OSHA regulate anything yes. in there where they come in and you have to have any kind of protective anything? Or do you just walk in like we walk in? and out of our house every day. We just walk in like we walk in. You, know. you don't have to worry anything special. But he gets to leave. But you get to leave, so you're not there 24 seven. You don't work, I mean, you don't play where you work. So the other thing is, um, we want to encourage you to start holding your meetings in the evening where residents that have to work for a living can be represented. There are hundreds of people that would want to be here today. And it's not really fair that you get to be here and get paid. You're working right now. Well, you might be retired. I'm retired too. So I don't have the luxury of being here, and I'm a volunteer as well, but everybody is not. And I'm sure that the people that are here from Rubbertown are not volunteers. And I'm sure that the people that are here from Rubbertown are being paid. But the people of the community need to be represented, and their voices need to be heard. And, you know, even if you get a survey, we need to be at the table. We do not want, we really don't want Rubber Town over here at all. I think if you could find some vacant land somewhere else, away from people, that would be the best. That would be a win-win situation for everybody. Because our health is at stake. We're dying. 20 years ago, before I moved into my house, I noticed that there was a pattern. Everybody that was in my community, they were dying within months of each other. So we just had a different, the neighbors. And now it looks like the same thing are happening. The neighbors on each side of me are dying and it's because it's environmental. And we have to do better. We don't want you to relax any laws in order to be able to do your job, in order to be able to do whatever it is that you do over there. It's toxic. That place lights up like a, a balloon at night. You can just see the flames coming out of it, and you know it's not any good. So, we do not recommend that you endorse relaxing the standards in order to allow the company. Do not relax the regulations for the company to 